Taylor, welcome to Mobile Calling. Welcome to Victoria Park. Have you ever played here before? Or? I haven't played, but I've watched, and hopefully I'll, when the draw comes out today for AFL Women's, I'll find out if I'm going to be playing here. Well, before we sort of get into the footy and the boxing and all the big issues, let's start with the biggest issue of all, which is dog washing on Altona Beach. You're trying to set up a business in Hobson's Bay. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's all happening in my little world. I frequent the dog beach at Altona, and anyone who goes knows that the sand is not pleasant. It's a bit of a muddy, yuck sand. And so someone with two long-haired border collies has to take them from the beach to the car, drive them down the road to the dog wash, not only wash the dogs, now wash the car. And I thought to myself, this is incredibly inconvenient. How can I help? And then I set off on a mission to find out, can I put a dog wash here? One of those spin the dial, pay 10 bucks, strap your dog in and you do it yourself, DIY. And I looked into it and I found a company that, that obviously sell them and I guess franchise them. So I've bought one. And now my next mission is to, to get it in the most convenient spot possible, which is the car park for the dog beach. And so hopefully very soon it'll be able to be used and um, can, help, can help people because Nothing worse than a smelly dog in your car. It'll be so cool to get your dog washed by Taylor Harris. Yeah. So, what's it, so you're working with Hobson's Bay Council to try and get through all the mechanics of it and permits and all that sort of palaver. Yeah, naturally yeah. there's a lot of permits and a few hoops yeah. to jump through, but thankfully I've been you know, working with a few people and to make sure that we you know, get it there somehow. And there's a few things that need to be ticked off first in terms of accessibility and um, you know, where exactly it's going to land and things like that. But when it goes there, it'll be a DIY one, so I won't necessarily be there, with the exception of being there washing my own dogs, so feel free to join in for that. But yeah, it's gonna be something that I hope can really benefit the community and can... And would you expand it, like if it works well, to other places maybe? Like, is yeah. that your dream? Yeah, I think so. I think it's very random, but something that is close to my heart, two dogs, you know, smelly dogs. What type of dogs have you got? Border Collies, chocolate, Long-haired border collies. One's How old are four, they? and one's eight months. Oh, fantastic! Very, they're very cute. So, do you think, like, obviously, you're 24, your boxing career, your footy career can only go. There's a shelf life for that. So, is this sort of like trying to set you up for later? I mean, yeah, I'm often trying to find random, lucrative kind of things to do, and this seemed. It was one of those moments where I was doing something. And I needed something, I didn't have it though. So how can I put it there? I'm not someone who walks past an issue or walks, you know, thinks, oh, it'd be great to have that and then just, you know, forgets about it. I was hell-bent on making sure that next time I go there, I'm gonna be able to wash my dogs without having to put them in the car. And it's gonna save everyone 50 bucks going to the car wash. Well, after. you're selling it very well. <laughs> m male footy players seem to have a really bad track record with like little pubs or whatever they own. Hopefully <laughs> that's not the same with with you guys, with you, you know? Like. Well, yeah, not, not necessarily pubs, but I'm definitely uh, into investing in properties. I've got two properties. I just secured a house in Perth as an investment a few weeks ago. So, um, yeah, certainly interested in setting myself up to make sure that I have the ability to enjoy life as opposed to having to grind for the rest of my life. But I've heard that you're now a marriage celebrant. Oh, yeah, that too. That must be like, <laughs> yeah, that exactly, you know. But I mean, it sort of, uh, coming in on the day, the probably the most important day of people's lives, it must be a pretty amazing job. I walk in the building game and it's not bad, but it's not exactly exciting every day. Like you're literally coming into the happiest day of people's lives. Well, exa exactly right. And that's, that's the reason that I would, was really keen to do it is because I wouldn't have thought I'm going to have a bad day when I'm with the people on the best day of their life. So, and if I can contribute into making that day perfect, then I wanted to. And I've already completed my first wedding and I've got my next one on Sunday coming. And it's just, the process is so fun. Everyone's so happy, you know, so willing to, to work with me to make sure that everyone, you know, is on the same page. So, it's so if somebody I'm out there to wants do. to like, have a look at your services for that, I mean, have you got a website for it or something? I do, I have a website, taylorharris.com.au. And it's Probably all there. Probably could have guessed it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all there. All my, obviously, footy stuff and you know partnerships and things like that there's potential to reach out for that stuff but the wedding celebrant there's another tab on the website section and you can inquire there you can send through straight to my email and then i'll get back to you if i'm available and if it's going to work out do you think sometimes that you might like upstage the bride being who you are and all that like <laughs> i hope not that's my goal not to and that's why i try and ask what kind of outfit are you, are you looking for do you want me to you know pop some color or do you want me to kind of be in the background and so i make sure i ask that question because Biggest fear is imagine if they're looking back at their photos thinking, oh, what'd she wear that for? Or what'd she, what'd she got her hair like that for? So I make sure I'm 
as cooperative as possible. And yeah, I just like to, you know, more smiling and just trying to make everything relaxed and enjoyable as possible. So, so with marriage celebrants, is it like, you know, I suppose if you're a parking inspector, you have a hit rate for many fines. Do you have a hit rate for many divorces come out of the marriages that you uh, officiate over? Well, I mean, that's another service. It'll be a second invoice, of course. Oh, yeah, I like no, you thinking just, that. Just kidding. But no, I think hopefully if I can make sure that day's a perfect one, then that can set the, the couple up for life. So were you nervous the first time you did it? Like, it's a pretty full-on thing to do. Well, yeah, it's a bit of responsibility, but it's something that I was incredibly prepared for. And that's the thing, you, you know, prepare fail to prepare and prepare to fail basically so I'm always on top of things especially for something so important as important as I am in preparing for footy of course so or boxing so make sure that I've got everything in order ready to go there's not going to be any hiccups um, I read your book the other day more than a kick which I found really interesting people should have a look at that um, and I just want to quote something that you wrote in there in primary school I guess you could say I was on the outer I didn't have much in common with girls, so I hung out with boys. Later, I had my struggles as a teenager too. I wasn't popular or cool, and I wasn't re interested in how I looked. Now, you're like totally the opposite, in the sense of- I think I'm cool. No, well, no, what do you mean? Well, yeah, you are, but I mean, you're, you're like super, super popular. How is, it, that must be a huge change for you, like mentally, or like how, how, do you, how, how, did, how, how did that progress for you? Well, I think now that you've read that out loud, when I said that, I remember saying it in a way, a very casual way, a very you know, easygoing, not, not phased about the fact that I felt like I wasn't cool. I wasn't trying to be cool. I wasn't aspiring to be the, the most popular girl in school and things like that. So I think that particular quote, to ensure it you know, comes across the, the way right it was context. intended, yeah. was purely just that I was happy with who I was and I was happy with the, you know, the status that I'd managed to fall into at school and whether the most popular person thought I was you know, worthy or cool or not didn't matter to me at all. And of course, in school, and particularly these days, girls find it a little bit challenging to, to go play sport at lunch because they'll probably get sweaty and their makeup will run yeah, or their yeah. hair will get messy or whatever. That wasn't an issue for me because I couldn't care less. And I loved school because I would spend of course, in class, we're doing, you know, schoolwork and whatever, but then I'd have a great time at recess and lunch. And that was just, you know, something I look forward to every day. But if you kind of drag through lunch and you sit down, you're bored the whole time and you, you don't do any activity, you've got no endorphins going on, then, you know, your day's a bit boring. But I made sure that there was no boredom in my day. I mean, it sounds a bit cliched, but it seemed to me sort of like, as a parent myself of kids who are in their 20s now, but when you have kids who might be a little bit isolated, or lonely at school for whatever reason yeah and then they think you know maybe their whole life is going to be like that and then you sort of hinted that maybe not exactly like that but a little bit like that at times and then look at you now like it's a, quite an inspirational message for those kids out there watching you maybe think oh, maybe I'm a freak or something like that yeah you well I, I mean I would float around from group to group I didn't necessarily rely on you know this this group of four people to be at school and if they're not there then I'm you know I'm worried or something like that I would be happy with sitting with this this group this day go and play basketball the next day, that group the third. So it, that's kind of how I was. And I think the ability to be fine in those sorts of situations is the key. Because if I felt like, you know, my, my best friend wasn't at school for a particular day and that was the worst thing that could possibly happen, that would that would be really challenging. Kids and I, catastrophize a bit, don't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I know that that's a thing. And I know that people get really anxious and worried when, when their person isn't at school. So I would encourage people to, to try and feel comfortable with their own, you know, their own company. And I think it's something that is a skill and some people never learn it and it takes a long time, but working on, you know, enjoying your own company and enjoying the fact that, you know, you're, you're strong and you're willing to do anything on your own. And then when you're with your friends and stuff, not only are they supporting you, you're supporting them. So taking on that role. And I guess if, if your friend's not at school for some reason, even checking in, you know, how come you didn't come to school today? And they might be, you know, not feeling great or a bit unwell. So. Those are some little tips, I suppose, to get through the day if it's a bit of an isolated one. I want to talk to you later about the infamous or famous 2019 photo, but what really came through to me, at least when reading your book, was that a certain uh, inner strength, you could almost say ruthlessness, uh, uh, about dealing with adversity. A lot of people would have been broken by that. Um, you actually turned it into its opposite. Literally, there's a bronze statue of you at Fed <laughs> Square. Like, I mean, that's just an amazing way of dealing with shit that people have to go through. I mean, 
was that something that just comes natural to you or like yeah because you could have taken that in a totally different way you could have gone into total depression and you know but you, you, you chose a different direction and I was well aware of that I knew that had I have curled up into a ball and you know said leave me alone and cried and you know stepped away from footy or anything I would have been absolutely forgiven if not encouraged to do that but I refused to do that because I thought the bigger picture and the bigger message was much more important than you know than how, how I was necessarily feeling. But the reality is, I was fine. I was very supported. I have an incredible network of friends, family, um, and, and footy club, of course. So I felt like it was my responsibility. No one else put this responsibility on me, but it was something that I took on board to make sure that if I can use this situation to, to you know, make, make it better and make it positive, then I absolutely will. Hence why I, it was very, I guess, negative and the angle was kind of everything, you know, everyone's so mean, everyone says nasty things and, and all that sort of stuff. But then I turned it around and I created the Taylor Kick Challenge, which of course was a hashtag on social media. People can post their kicks and it, you know, I was amazing. spread the, the message response. around. All ages, yeah. young, old, boys, girls, whoever. And that it was, photograph in your book of that young girl was just yeah, amazing. Yeah, it was the best. Yeah. And I had a fair That's the best boots. photo in the book, yeah. She, yeah. yeah. Much better than mine. No, um, well, I mean, the, the mine, book is amazing, honestly, but that was, was just inspiring. MJ, you know? her name was, and yeah. I, I sent her some boots. And then I saw her um, in, in person not long after that, and we caught up and chatted, and I follow along, you know, how she's going and her family, um, you know, stay in touch. So those little things that managed to come of a situation that seems in the moment so all-consuming, but if you kind of step back for a minute and think, you know, what's happening here? Because the whole time I was just thinking, what is going on? Like, wh why is this a thing? And it was an interesting kind of thing psychologically to think about. Why do people say these things in the first instance? And then why are people so, uh, you know, agitated by it and so willing to stand up for it and, and bring the issue to light? So obviously it was a much bigger and, and um, wider spread issue than I perhaps knew at the time. And I, as I said, took that on and thought, here we go, let's, let's go with it and see what happens. One of the things you touched on, I don't know if it was in the book or in an interview, is that a lot of these trolls, some of them are freaks, but some of them aren't freaks. They're just like normal people yeah. who live normal lives. And some of them have got sons and daughters, are married and just live normal lives. And they, for whatever reason, they go online and just think they can just do and say the most disgusting, vile things. I mean... Yeah, well, that's right. And that's the incredibly concerning part. Like, I remember there was one particular comment well, there's many, but one particular one that I happened to come across. It was com incredibly vulgar and vile, and I happened to see that this person had a profile picture, because normally the anonymous ones don't. So I've clicked on the profile, which is on Facebook, and it comes up with the profile picture of a dad with, the fa with his family and young daughters, mind you. And so I've thought even further, if this person thinks it's okay to say these awful things to someone they don't know and publicly, then what on earth could they think is okay behind closed doors or you know the way that they treat their daughters or wife and then of course the message that gets taught to these young young people is horrible and it's not I couldn't I couldn't accept it so then I of course called it out mm. and then yeah I, I guess everyone else who jumped on board recognized that and thought equally as much this is not acceptable let's stop it and then of course there was this you know whole ripple effect and international coverage of yeah. it and everyone just resonated because everyone at some point has had some ad adversity and has had people try and be negative or nasty or mean whether it be online or not and so people just you know resonated with someone standing up for themselves which I was and it was I was uncompromisingly doing that and it's something that my parents had taught me since I was young to, to stand up for myself so it was in my in my nature and I just did it without any fuss and it was that, that, was ba that was what happened. The reports, I guess, were perhaps a little bit more dramatic than that or that I'd had some sort of, you know, huge thought process or whatever, but the reality was, this was distressing and, and upsetting me. I'm gonna do something about it. Two seconds thought. And then of course I posted the status. So, so people have to do all that as individuals, but it would be also good if society dealt with it, I guess, yeah. as well. I mean, do you think that social media companies, your Googles, your Facebooks, your Twitters, should take up a bit more responsibility than maybe they're doing. I know the Prime Minister yeah, started recently a campaign the, recently. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, of course, the, the Prime Minister getting on board and I guess advocating for this to be rectified is incredibly important, a huge step. Because it's taken myself, I know Erin Molan um, up in Sydney, she's a, had a, a similar experience and has been really, um, really brave to speak out against it as well. 
And then for f finally, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say finally, but I mean, you know, eventually the, the Prime Minister has um, made a real point to say that's enough now, you know, and so that's something that's going to help definitely because wouldn't have thought you're going to argue with the Prime Minister's, you know, power. And I think the social media um, accounts or companies, platforms, companies yeah. have, yeah, become a little bit more responsible than they perhaps were. And I'm not sure exactly what, you know, what the rules and the new settings and things like that are, but definitely a step in the right direction. And I think it's just, you know. If you were a journalist working for the Herald Sun or The Age and you said, with no evidence that that person is a bank robber, you would get sued like that. You'd probably lose your job. You would. Um, but if you put that on social media, you know, and I think some of the social media companies say, oh, it's really too hard. But every time I advertise for a new table in my house, I get inundated with ads the next day. Yep. So they're all over my personal behavior. So if I, you know, I can't understand why they can't restrict or, or stop or out the accounts of, of, of dickheads who do trolling, Correct. you know? Well, I mean, there's a documentary. I haven't watched it yet, but it's about someone, a whistleblower from Facebook, basically saying they can do that. They, there is the ability to do that. But it would be a bil billions of dollars hit. That's on, what it's all about. And of course it's all about that. So it's a business at the end of the day, but at what point does mm. human life become well, more people important? Are, kids are dying in some yeah, in this in is extreme the cases, you know? Yeah, this is the reality. They are... Bullying online is absolutely the reason for many suicides, teen, adult, any age. So it's, if you don't think that that's the truth, then you're a little bit naive because it is. And it's, in school, it's just, it makes me infuriated, but then really upset more so to think that this is what kids have to deal with. When I'm in school, I'm just kicking the ball around at lunchtime. I don't even, I don't even have a phone. So I think I was pretty lucky to have gone through that period of time to be a school goer. Let, let's just backtrack a bit, like you're a Queensland girl, you brought up in the northern suburbs of Brisbane, you de but you come from good, like at least on your, your dad, it was like, if, if I'm not mistaken, he played footy yeah. uh, for Queensland, not, not rugby league, but yeah, footy AFL. footy, so, um, and boxed himself. So, um, like, tell me a little bit about how you got into sport as a kid. Well, that, I guess what you touched on, dad played sport. And so I wanted to be everything dad was. And I guess a lot of kids kind of do that, look up to their parents. Mum as well was athletic herself and always was out and about. We would always be at the beach. We'd always be doing activities on the boat. Dad's a boat mechanic, so we were always on the water. And I just loved, I loved activity and I loved to be out enjoying the sunshine. And it was just encouraged from when I was a really young person. So I suppose it was just something that I, all I knew. And then I started playing footy at a team environment and I loved the camaraderie and, you know, getting... Was it weird playing footy? In, in, in Queensland, well, yeah, compared I mean, to say people think this, league, but you know, it, uh, my club. I was suppose the, Brisbane Lions are up there now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Course, my yeah. club was the Aspley Hornets, and it was an incredible club. Like they they were so welcoming, and I was the only girl, and I was not made once feel out of place. In fact, I was so encouraged and so supported at that footy club, and I will forever be in debt to them because I know that that's not the experience all young girls had growing up playing footy with the boys in a mixed competition and. Yeah, I can just be thankful for that for the rest of my life because I had no, no genuine, you know, issues with except for a, little, a few comments here and there. But then, as soon as on the field that would happen, and my teammate, you know, who's still a friend of mine, a boy would stand up for me, and then that, and I felt fine and protected, and that was something I can be truly grateful for. So, so before testosterone kicks in for boys with puberty, like there's absolutely no reason that girls and boys can't play if they if girls want to in the same team. They should obviously have the option to have girls yeah, only league. Yeah, it's the option. Um, it's the so, did you find when you were playing like the only girl in that club that other girls treated you different? That the boys treated you different? That they were maybe a bit intimidated or freaked out that you were better than them or equal to them or whatever? Yeah, or? I think intimidated is probably the right word for a couple here and there that would get a bit frustrated or flustered, and I think that definitely comes from parents, perhaps in the opposite team, not necessarily in my team that I noticed. But in the opposite team, like there was a few boys who would target me, whether it be physically or, you know, verbally. And I presume it comes from their parents saying, you know, what's a girl doing out there? She shouldn't be out there. Don't let her beat you. Yeah, All you these sort of, sort of commentary. Of that. And that just fueled me. And then I went on to eventually win the league award in under 12s, which of course, under 12s, no big deal. But it was a big deal for me because I was the only girl. and. I had every excuse. Your dad must have been so proud. To not do you know what I mean? Like having yeah. a girl playing and, and kicking He, he arse, is you know? so proud. And he yeah. never, you know, and your mom, wavers. Yeah, they, yeah, and they never waver from the fact that they 
were the biggest advocates and supporters. They were always there, always stood up for me. No one could say a bad word because then, you know, they'd get shut down. Mum and Dad would politely let them know that that's not the way it is and, and I work as hard as anyone else and um, I'm there because I should be, not because of any tokenism or, or anything like that. When, when did you sort of first realise that you were really, really good at this? Like uh, you could potentially be an elite athlete. Like did that... Well, I think I was hell-bent on training and becoming an athlete in any sense, whether it be athletics, because I liked athletics, soccer, footy or, or boxing. What position did you play in soccer? I'm just as a soccer Goalkeeper. Freak. Oh, you okay. You might have been able to You got guess. the height for it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, our school was a soccer school, and so yeah. it, it was my ticket to get the day off school if I went and represented the school. And I'll take advantage think, of that. Yeah. yeah. So when I was younger, um, I would run around the block ten, 10 times until I threw up. I would do all these... I'd be hell-bent, I'm going to do 100 push-ups today. There was no, I was going to do 101. I was just that way, um, and I still am. Like, if I decide that I want to do something in training, whether it's hurts or is hard, I don't, I'm doing it, because I said I was going to do it four yeah. hours ago. And so I think I've always had that mindset and that, I guess, athlete ability or athlete mindset. Um, and, of course, as I've got older, I've fallen into programs, and with the AFLW now, I'm with an amazing footy club at Melbourne that just nurture me and support me to be that athlete and ha I have everything you know at my disposal that I'll utilize and I guess that that's going to give me the ability to be the best version of myself. I, I guess there's a lot of young women now I mean as, as a, I coached women's soccer for a long time there's a lot of young women coming into football what sorry I should say soccer but <laughs> I call it foot, football footy AFL but boxing yeah. le less Few, fewer do that and you but you started boxing at a really really young age I mean yeah I was only 12 when dad just took me down to the local boxing gym and threw me in there and said, let's You know that well, Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they get hit in the face. Yeah. I mean, what was that like the very first time as a 12 year old, yeah. somebody like hit you in the face? Well, I remember. Legally, you know? Yeah. Like, you know? Well, whether this was legal or not, the coach at the time, he had an eye patch or something. I remember something about him, something was going on. Anyway, it was a real savage, like a pirate. Um, and he was, it was in the local PCYC, there was the basketball court and then there was this little room down the side and that's when the boxing gym was. I think there was half a dozen bags that you know, were taped up because they'd been used so much. And so dad and I are in there, you know, father-daughter activity. <laughs> it was kickboxing that I started with. Yeah. And this coach was such a savage. He would demonstrate, but he wouldn't hold back. And I'm 12. So I'm, he's like, come up, come up here and you know, demonstrate. Okay, and so I'm holding my hands up, not knowing what I'm doing. And he just like whacks me. He's like, Jesus. 10 push-ups or something like that. Like I, I just, all I remember is how savage this coach was. And I loved it. I was like, yes, like, come on. And I had this mental toughness, I presume from playing footy with the boys and just being uncompromisingly refusing to be the only girl who's average or below everyone else because she's a girl. I did not want an excuse. I was never going to come last in the 2K time trial because because I'm a girl, whether I come second last, that's fine. I'm not going to come last because then everyone will just say, oh, well, you know, obviously yeah, yeah. she's a girl. So I was just hell bent on not giving myself an excuse to be below anyone else. And then that, of course, flowed into the boxing gym as well. And then I fell in love with the sport. I actually started kickboxing. So I kickboxed for a few years and dad still kickboxes. My coach, his name was Azatron. He was at Corporate Box, a gym on the north side of Brisbane. Suddenly he passed away. I went into training and you know he, he wasn't there anymore. And so now I had you know I obviously had to find a new coach. And my current coach, Farish Chevalier, he was the head boxing coach at the time. And so I've transferred from kickboxing to boxing now. And I really love boxing and the the pure you know skill that requires boxing, the footwork. Not that kickboxing doesn't have that, but I guess like the footwork and um, fainting and all this sort of head movement and stuff like that I found really, really cool and transferable to footy as well, my new footwork, of course, around stoppages. Is boxing like training harder? It seems to me that you train just as hard except you're getting hit while you're, being, while yeah. you're training. <laughs> it just seems to me the hardest training of any sport well, in the world. So it's, it's proven the hardest sport to do. It takes absolutely everything out of you. Um, or it takes everything that you've got. And it challenges you like no other. Of course, footy does that too in, in different ways. Probably the fact that you've got all your teammates helps a lot. In boxing, you have your teammates and your training partners and things like that. And things like that. But at the end of the day, it's just you and your opponent. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's the exact definition of it. It's you versus your opponent 
whoever's the best wins. You can, if you're having a bad day as a footy player, you can hide sort of, to Correct. a certain degree yeah. with, amongst the other players. But That's boxing, true. it's just... No hiding. It's like the difference between a stand-up comedian and being in a large band. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, if you're shit, yeah. you can be hidden <laughs> in the band, but, like, you know. And that's, but that's the reason I love it, because it demands everything from you. And if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. Like, you've got you've to deal with that. And that's, you know, that's the reality of it. I've had a draw once, and it, um, it was the best learning experience, much better than any win that I've had. And so... So you've had seven wins, one draw. Yeah, seven wins, one and draw. And Out of all the wins, they were all fine. You've got two Australian titles. That's pretty yeah. good hit rate. Well, all the wins were, you know, were good and I learned a lot from them as well. But the thing I learned the most from was the draw. Um, so I, what I do you mean by that? Those. Well, I think I could have been incredibly negative and thought, oh, I should have done better. I definitely didn't perform to my best on the night. I didn't prepare to my best as well. That's definitely something I was am now adamant that I must I must prepare as well as possible. There's a few factors that came in, the date for the event moved and things like that, which made it a little bit interesting, but I probably didn't adapt well enough. And so I looked back at it and I thought, this sh I shouldn't have had a draw. I should have been able to win this fight, but, and I presume my opponent also said that, and that's, you know, that's boxing. But yeah, I um, came back better, stronger, more prepared next time and managed to win. So I take that as a, as a win, as opposed to a negative or a loss. Obviously, you have to be super fit to be a footy player at your level. But with boxing, because you're champ, Australian champion at the moment with two different weights, welterweight and middleweight, is that right? Yeah, super yeah. welterweight. So has that been hard, like the, the weight, just to get your weight right for whatever division that you're in? Yeah. Like that's something you don't have to really deal with in, in footy. Correct, yeah, weight cutting is brutal. It's something that I don't love. Just to an outsider, just explain what well, that is. Because you have to dehydrate. Yes, so yeah. I lost 11 kilos for my second fight at Super World Weight, which is 69.75 kilos. Um, I today weigh 77 kilos, so it probably puts it into a bit of perspective. I'm in the middle of footy pre-season, so I'm probably feeling really fit, running a lot, obviously. But in, in boxing, of course, you fluctuate a fair bit, um, depending on what phase of the camp you're in and things like that. You have to cut weight. The reason behind it is to try and gain an advantage on your opponent. So obviously I'm a taller, longer fighter. If I can get down to a lighter weight, I will be even taller, even, and your reach will just, even longer, yeah. even um, bigger on the day than my potential opponent. So that's why you would cut weight as opposed to just fighting at the weight I'm at today, because someone else who's realistically 85 kilos. Does that negatively impact your body? Like that constant uh, up and down of, it's, it's almost like being a, like a sports, um, what's the word, you know, um, anyway, is, it must be tough. Yeah, I, I would have thought nutritionists don't love it, yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's the sport. It, it's, it's a factor that you have to overcome. It's part of it. There's a skill to cutting weight and there's a healthy way and an unhealthy way. I go about things in the healthy way. I've got nutritionists that helps me um, and for the most part, we'll, We'll do it by dieting, so we'll cut weight by adjusting my, my diet through the weeks in leading up. Then the last little bit, we might cut water weight, it's called. So I might go in the sauna and dehydrate. I might water load, so I'll drink a lot of water four days out, I'll drink eight litres first day, eight litres the second day, four litres, and then nothing. So my body thinks I'm still drinking eight litres, takes 24 hours to adjust and to realise that I'm not consuming, so I'm peeing out more than I was drinking. That's the method behind that. Or there's plenty of other ways, like sweating in a sweatsuit. Most people have seen them in the movies. They are so stinky. <laughs> but it, yeah, so it's part of it. But I actually, I hate it more than anything. It's very uncomfortable and I love to eat food. So don't love that part. But it, I get, I'm hell bent on achieving this goal. There's two fights, weighing in the right, correct weight and then actually having the fight. And some would argue that weighing in is even harder than the fight night. I can believe that. So, so, are you going to keep boxing? I mean, have you got a, a, yep. a vision to go, like maybe for a world fight? Title yeah, fight, I will win a world title one day when the opportunity. What's comes What's your up. favourite weight? Oh, definitely not sixty nine. That was yeah. that was incredibly tough. Of course, eleven kilos is obscene. When is welterweight um, higher than middleweight or the other middleweight way? Middleweight's higher. So yeah. uh, middleweight's seventy two point five. Welterweight sixty nine point eight five. So you might go for middleweight. I'm thinking. What Asian first, and then maybe. Well, world or what? what how, would you, how would that work potentially? It's, probably, it's up to my promoters and my. And what, what do the footy team think about? What do, what do Melbourne think about? Well, that? Melbourne is 
incredibly encouraging. Of course, there's there's, there's only broads on ground. You're gonna yeah. Be there. Well, that's right. I'm the enforcer. They call you're me. the enforcer. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. But there is certainly a time to box that's allocated yeah. half of the year and a time to play footy. And of course, with the nature of footy right now being a short season, it allows me to do that. And it's something that I am passionate about and makes me a better athlete and person overall. And it's and I learn and transfer a lot of the skill and a lot of the particularly mental side to footy. So the reality is it helps my footy and hence why the footy club's so encouraging of me competing. And each time I fight, I learn an incredible amount. I then take that onto the footy field and there's moments where I think, I don't know if I can do this. And then I think back, I've, I've been in a boxing fight. I've been in the fifth round of a boxing fight. I can do this. Yeah. And so that, those are the things that can definitely add value to and X factor to my footy. So just to go back to Brisbane from a city, playing for Brisbane Lions and then the opportunity of Carlton comes up. What, what came out from your book to me was that you like just jumped at that chance. You, yeah. you make these, you talk about um, being comfortable, being uncomfortable and fortune favors the brave. It sounded like you just couldn't, you were gagging to get to Melbourne. Yeah. Um, what, 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 was, what was the attraction? I mean, obviously playing for Carlton, but well, I mean, it, was I, more, it seemed like I, also the city. Yes, it's a very different I, city. I didn't necessarily. I, I, I mean, I love Brisbane, but it's a, Melbourne is a different city. Yeah, it, well, it is. That's for sure. I didn't move from Brisbane Lions to play for Carlton. The way that I got to Victoria was to play for Carlton. Um, of course, that was an exciting prospect in itself. But the reality is, I wanted to move from Queensland to Victoria. I wanted to experience what Melbourne's like. I've been there a few times for you know trips, visiting friends, and things. Thought it was the coolest place on earth. Even with the cold? The Australian Open. Yeah, I like the cold. I, I love the fashion, you know, layers and things. What's but the big difference between the two cities in your mind? Obviously the weather, um, yeah. but just the, I guess the speed of the city. Brisbane yeah. is a pretty relaxed. You can kind of go about things at your own pace and um, there's great things. To, it's certainly getting, you know, more high paced and the Olympics being there is going to be an enormous yeah. lift for the, for the city. But when I lived there five years ago, when I moved from there, there wasn't, you know... Was that your first time away from home? Yeah, I moved out for six months, just, you know, across the city. But was I that challenging or did you like it? Or like I liked it, but I probably lived on noodles and toast <laughs> for the whole time. Um, but then I, I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be... I wanted to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable, being away from family and everything that I knew. I just threw myself in the deep end and it was a sink or swim situation living down here. I, I did know in the back of my mind and mum and dad also had the affirmation that if I needed to come back, I could get on a plane and come back. That was then challenged, of course, by coronavirus, which meant that I couldn't go back at all with the borders closed. So that would have been a, hard. That was, inc that was incredibly hard, much harder than I realised at the time. I now reflect on it and think that really like, rocked me a lot. But I've you know, come good now and hopefully Christmas time coming, the borders open the way they should and then I can go and enjoy time with family because I miss them a lot, of course, and they're an incredible support. So you're going to go back for Christmas? and Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think a lot of, especially Melbourneians rather than Victorians, sort of think that Queensland is a big redneck area and everyone's oh. backwards and so on. But what really struck me, again, from your book and doing some reading about, like one of your best mates is Indigenous. The pl your favourite place that you've ever been to, you said, was Japan. Yeah. And one of the things that attracted you to Melbourne, you said, was the multicultural mix. So it sounds like very progressive attitudes, you know? I mean, what, what is that true? Is that a good... Es yeah, a good estimation of well, I think your views. Sometimes when you look at a, a footy club, for example, this is a small sample of essentially the community because a footy club often represents various different um, different people in not just people from different backgrounds and walks of life, but an incredible group of people that you can learn lots and lots of things from because of their different experiences growing up, their different experiences moving around or you know living in different places, meeting different people. I think it would be pretty boring to be in a place that is you know the same people that just you know chat about the same sort of thing. Now that I'm down here I've got you know people that have come into my life that have shared experiences about what they've gone through and I've thought to myself like wow I'm incredibly lucky to to have been brought up with a supportive family and I had a roof over my head, food to eat. And that's just, like, perspective is an incredible thing. And I've certainly learnt that living here away from family. And, you know, some people don't even have family. And it's just, yeah, I guess when you grow up, you have to, a bit of a dose of perspective isn't a bad thing.
But you are still a little bit of a bogan when it comes to food. You take lettuce out of right. rice paper rolls I read. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, that, that's <laughs> very, must take ages I've to come, do that. I've come a long way with eating. I used to be quite picky and not eat anything adventurous, but since moving down here, I was pretty much forced to try things because every menu has some sort of quirkiness about it. So, yeah. I've just just on Japan, like, w w I mean, it is an amazing place with amazing history, but what, why, what was your, why did you love it so much? It's just such an amazing, it's an amazing place. The people there is the reason that I love it so much. Of course, it's really cool. It's high tech. It's all that sort of stuff. The contrast between one hour out of the city and in the city is amazing. But the people, like, I remember I, as a bit of an experiment, I stood in the train station looking confused on purpose. Where am I going to go? I knew where I was going. But I was waiting to see how long it would take a local to come up and try and help me. I, or straight away, this man came up, couldn't speak any English, but purely just wanted to try and help, try his best. And so he's like, speaking Japanese and I'm oh, sorry I can't I can't say and so then we communicated I guess via just signals and things like that pointing and then he walked me all the way to my platform I said thank you so much he then I realized that he missed his train because then he walked straight across the other platform I could see him across the tracks he'd missed his train in order just to make sure I caught mine like Gee, that's that's, so that's the kind of person I didn't ask him he came to me and I said Thank you, like tried to, you know, he said, I'll walk you up, or, you know. And so I was just, yeah, I, that's the kind of people I want to be around. You'd never get out of London people. or somewhere well, in New York, you know. So I've heard. think you were a freak, you know. <laughs> that's but amazing. I, it is. It's the most incredible place. And it, that's just, you know, the nature. Did you train there as well? I did. I trained, yeah. I trained over there. I was that kickboxing train, or boxing? Uh, boxing at the time. I try and train wherever I am and find a way somehow, whether it be at a local gym I just walk into and pay a one-day fee or... And I met, I've met some friends like through that. We don't speak at all any of you know, the same language, but we communicate via boxing. And so I've become friends with people. On social media, I follow them along their, like, their journey and their career. And the reason is because I just walked into a boxing gym one day, held my gloves up and said, can I train? We did partner work together. It was, yeah, it's just, I can't even, when I talk about it, I get so excited because it's, to That's be, very brave, to though. Open, so a lot of people would see that as very brave and inspirational, actually. Well, Probably. to be open-minded and to, to want to learn yeah. about other countries, to learn about other people and why other people act the way they do, and to understand that the Japanese culture is just that, to be kind to people, to respect people, not to litter. The one thing that I always think about it's is... It's really clean. That it's so clean. There's hardly any bins, but there's hardly any rubbish. So everyone just respects each other and takes their rubbish home. That's But there's a lot of... Plastic. That's the other thing I realised. You go to the shop and you get six bananas each individually wrapped. Like it's, you know, it's... And a lot of vending machines. A lot of vending machines. You can get the most strangest things in <laughs> Japanese vending you machines. Can. Maybe let's not go down that road. Yeah, um, that's a can of worms. So, exactly. So you've played for 340 clubs. You're going through pre-season now. Just wondering, is it different in the training in those three clubs? Or yeah, is it pretty much the same? Or oh, I mean, there's things that are the same, of course. The intensity is expected. There's a high standard when you get into an AFLW club or an AFL club. And yeah, I think there's, the differences are probably based on the coach's opinion or outlook on the game. And there's hundred, Melbourne seems to be different The Melbourne ma ma men's team seems to be the fittest out there. And the Darren Burgess guy, you know, as a soccer freak, like he used to oh, coach yeah, of course. Arsenal, Arsenal, you know, yeah. like he was a fitness uh, coach for Arsenal and they He's brought him over. And I just think it's had a big impact. Do you, does that feed off onto your team, like with Melbourne? Yes, well, I think our uh, head of high performance, David Regan, he works along with the men's program as well. Mm. So he's obviously, he's, he was the two IC um, for Darren Burgess. So to learn from someone like that and then for it to flow into our program, it's incredibly clear. There was an article that was brought out a few weeks ago by the Melbourne Footy Club and it basically was Darren Burgess saying, we're not going to cushion these players, we're going to condition them to get through anything. If you roll your ankle a little bit, you're not going to have the session off. You're going to get through it. If you feel a little bit unwell, you're going to get through it. Because if you're on game day, that happens and we need you. What are you going to do if you haven't prepared or if you haven't felt that before? You, you don't know what to do. And I love that approach because in boxing, it's the same thing. If you're in the second round, you've broken your hand, for example, which happens very often. You've still got eight rounds to go. What, what are you going to do? Just give up? No, you're going to work it out. You're going to jab for the rest of the fight. You're going to use your left hand. You might switch to southpaw. Whatever you might do but you get through it somehow. You don't say, oh, my hand, you know, I've hurt my hand, I'm gonna have to quit. Not, doesn't happen. So I love that approach. It's come through in the women's program. We very rarely have people in the rehab group, and if they are, they're only in there for a short period of time. 
training is at a very high intensity um, and I think that's going to absolutely put us in good stead for games. So just while we're on the AFL, AFLW, I mean, it seems to me that's like a bit weird. Like, shouldn't it be AFL M, AFL W, uh, or are you not really that bothered about I, stuff I'm like not that? bothered, to be honest, but I guess someone did it right, or someone did explain to me, AFL is, of course, the overarching company, I guess, or the, the franchise. So then it would kind of lead, lead you to think that perhaps it would make sense, AFL yeah. M, AFL W. The A-League, I think, did that, something similar. They combined A-League women's, A-League men's. But personally, it's not, it's not the world's biggest issue. I think there's other things that... Um, yeah, yeah. It's substance more than come, symbolism that's important first. to you. Yeah, I yeah. think, yeah, I'm, I, I think we're, yeah, we're proud to be AFLW. Like, we, we own that and we're proud of that. Um, and so I don't think there's anything to, you know, to discredit AFL women's or anything, but I just, yeah. Whether AFL men's want to add the M, that's probably their decision. With, with the like, EPL, with the English Premier League in the UK, the women's league is parallel, it's simultaneous with the men's league. So if you go on Optus Sport tonight and, you know, like the women's games are advertised in a slightly different colour to the men's team. So it'll just say Arsenal versus Tottenham and you'll only know it's the women's team because it's a slightly colour, different oh, yeah. colour background. Yeah. While here, you guys play what's essentially a winter sport in the summer. Yes. Do you think that's a bit tough on the AFLW? Do you think it'd be better if they had some, like you guys play just before the men's game? Would you prefer that or do you have an opinion on that? I don't really have an opinion because I understand the, um, the commercial side of things and the fact that the broadcast, it's not, it's not possible. There's too many games of footy on the weekend. Not, not too many, but there's so many games of footy in the AFL men's season that are played. Where, where can we fit? We don't get time. We don't get air time. We don't get space. So the reality is we are happy to be standalone, having our own air time and the ability to have free day TV broadcasting. And I guess that's the trade-off. We play in summer. I like playing in summer, and there's no such thing as summer here in Melbourne, really, except for a few days. It's like, this is the first hot day in, in months, isn't it? So, yeah, I, I like the fact that we play in summer and that we have our own space. Um, our, even our own space up until this year, albeit, uh, away from the Australian Open, we, we were this gap of time in the sporting calendar in Australia that, I guess, was free, and, you know, we took it up. So I'm pretty proud that we can have our standalone and we can we can do that and we can you know be proud of that and then for footy fans it's awesome footy all year round almost so three quarters of the year it's pretty it's a pretty great time to be a footy fan with, with, with the paid differential um it's about 17k on average for women's footy and about 363 yeah. for men you've argued well you know your season is shorter your games are shorter um, they don't get, you don't get as many people turning up as you would to a men's game. So you've sort of said it's not as simple as it looks. Yeah, so um, it's I was just wondering if you could develop that point of view, you know? Yeah, well, clearly it's not as simple as here's all the money that the men get. Like, that's just, that's not the reality. In order for us to get the same amount of money that the men get, we then need to do the same amount of work, which we do in our own time. We, we do train um, all year round as opposed to the six months contract that we, we sign on that would be probably the first step to to allow us to have a 12 month contract and the ability to keep training and have an income at the same time that would probably be a good step but then in terms of having equal pay to the men I think it requires a buy-in from both sides the organization and the athlete so we need to then understand that if we would like this we have to you know do the same which is a full-time you know pretty much can't really travel except for only a couple months of the year set up but if we're if we have that belief and if we're if we get the opportunity I have no doubt that we'll absolutely um, do everything and be these incredible athletes because there's potential for sure but it just takes you know it's it's a double oh, no. double-edged sword it's a two-way street two -way it's street. a two-way street so when you know the organization buys in we buy in mm. and you're never going to know unless both do at the same time one can't be you know, at that equality point without the other. And so it's going to take the AFL or cricket, which I know cricket has made some great leaps, netball, soccer, all these other sports are really making um, an impact in this space, as is AFL. But it's just going to take somebody high up, whether it's the CEO or the, you know, the, the president of the footy club or whoever, just to say, this is it, this is happening today, let's do it. This is the way it should be. We're going to give them an opportunity and just give us a go. That's all we ask, we want to go. Um, we want a chance to be able to prove that we're willing to put in all the work. One of the things that sort of pissed me off a little bit was the pushback that you got when you 
put up the wage claim for 150k as if you were like some type of greedy type of person. Like my daughter is the same age as you and she works on a construction site in Melbourne in a union CFMU member union organized construction job. And that's basically what she gets for holding a lollipop or working <laughs> yeah. as a builder's labor. <laughs> Um, and, and she deserves it because they fought hard for those conditions and I'm, you know, I work in the, in the same game. Um, you would bring so much, you know, in terms of your profile, in terms of your skills to a club. 150K, I mean, that's what construction workers get. That's, yeah. you know, like it, it is, well, there's the, a lot the, of, there was a lot of bullshit with that. Yeah. When the, it, the conversation is really interesting. And the even more interesting part is that actually never happened. I never asked for that money as of, right, okay. as of, you know, briefly said, but the reality is, it was much more important that that conversation was had exactly like you've just alluded to. The fact that that is not an obscene amount of money when it was, you know, touted to be just some greedy, you know, crazy amount of money that I reportedly had asked for. So I had to sit back and think, this is a crazy situation. Why do people care so much when you flick the newspaper to the next page and see that one of the AFL men's players is getting $6 million, no problem, good on him. Six million dollars, like, and of course, of course, granted, like, I'm not saying that he shouldn't, but the contrast was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I, like, I understand my impact on the game and the fact that I am used a lot um, in the promotion of the game and whether I ask for it or not. Um, yeah, it's my off-field impact and contribution I mean, what other what other footy player, male football, football, has got an Amazon show about to come out? Do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, seriously, I like one hundred and fifty k. It's it's really insulting. So, can you just talk a bit about that Amazon? I mean, that's just freaky. That you've got this is coming out soon. Yeah, they've so, been with you for how long? Two years, um, following you around. Probably a year in total now, or a year and a half, maybe. That's so exciting. That's yeah, going to be an international exciting. profile an for international you. International documentary. Like, sorry to keep going and banging on about one hundred and fifty k, no, but I literally don't, lollipop people that, get that on union jobs in Melbourne I and you bring in an international profile <laughs> to your club and sport But the reality is, Amazon. if I don't laugh, I'll cry because it's like, it's pretty laughable that this is such a topic when it shouldn't be. Totally. When yeah. I didn't... Yeah, and you, you've got to do a friggin' dog cleaning business. Like, sorry, do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, really, people have to have some context here. Yeah, like, context. No, no other sports star has got an Amazon documentary coming out about them other than you. Well, context is foreign in the media, in Australian media particularly. So, yeah. of course, that was the headline that was going to grab attention. So, of course, they went with it. And I understand newspapers need to be sold, articles need to be clicked on. But at my expense, it's pretty frustrating. And, um, yeah, it impacted me a lot. But the reality is, or impacted me and my family because it was attacking my character. That was frustrating. But the reality is, if I stood back for a minute and thought to myself, this is bigger than me, this conversation is important, and like you already alluded to, I, I can hear your opinion is that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a matter of fact, of, you know, of course, whether I am or not, it's different opinion, but some, you know, an AFL women's player is worth more than what we're getting paid right now. Um, and I think somebody did the numbers, I can't remember who it was, but basically we play AFL women's realistically after all the training we do outside of contract hours. For like a dollar fifty an hour, or Are you something serious? like that. Yeah, dollar fifty an hour, and probably more for those who are able to, you know, because I obviously am in a position to train full time with boxing and footy. Well, almost full time, I guess. I still have to do other work to get an income, but yeah, it's we certainly play for the love of the game. There's no question about that. If if I wanted to make real money, I would absolutely do something else. If I wanted to have a you know a substantial income. I would not be playing football. That's the, that's the reality and that's the overarching thing that people don't care to understand. And that's why I don't need, I don't need to explain. And then the thing that is also perplexing is that in what world do people talk about people's contracts? Except for in professional the media. sport. Yeah. yeah, it's not yeah. appropriate. It's not, no, it's, totally. in fact, it's almost illegal, isn't it? Yeah. To, you know, discuss private and confidential matters. So that part made, you know, that's plastered all over the media. Kind of made me think yeah. a little bit, this is a bit, a bit of a strange world I'm living in, but it is what it is. And I have to, you know, get on because it's out of my control. I just have to keep pushing forward. And the next thing that I'm going to do, my next move, my next chess move is to play good footy. And that's all that I'm focusing on. And that's all I have been focusing on for you know, the, la you know, the last year. And I can't wait for my first game and my debut game with Melbourne to show what I've been doing, you know, away from anyone else. Just tell, just couple of last questions just tell us a little bit about this Amazon 
um, doco. What's that? What's that about? Are you allowed to talk yeah, about it? Yeah. yeah. So the Amazon documentary. It's going to be called Kick Like Taylor. Uh, it's going to be basically following me around what I'm doing, my training, um, and then all sorts of you know fun little other characteristics of mine that I do and what I get. When's up it to. coming out? There isn't a fixed date right now that I can disclose, but around sometime next mid year. Mid next year. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good, but it's going to so be. Take out your subscription to Amazon now. Yeah, in get, advance. sign up yeah. for Amazon yeah. Prime Video, and it's going to be good. It's like it's a documentary that I hope. Is know, it a series or a, or a one-off? One documentary, one yeah. one film. Yeah. But I hope it inspires people, and I hope people can see themselves in me. In a sense, you'll get to see my personality a lot more than perhaps I give out, particularly on social media. I'm very protective with that. I don't give a lot. Um, but when I think it's an appropriate time, which I do now with this documentary, to show you know what I'm about, what I get up to outside of sport how I interact with my friends and family. I think it's going, to be, it's going to be fun because I'm really proud of the way that I am and how I hold myself. And if that can come across in the right way, which I know it will with the crew at Amazon, then it's going to be a win-win for everyone. And the reason I signed up for it, well, the, one of the reasons, is because imagine when I'm older with kids or grandkids, I can show them this very high quality footage of me when I was younger because that's all I want. I want to see my mum and dad running around when they were little and see what they were like. Oh, it would be so cool. The, um, the, uh point in your book where you said, I hate my phone, I really related to that okay. as, a, as a local politician. And I just wondered, like, you've spent your whole life training, eating right, you know, apart from taking the lettuce out of rice papers. I eat lettuce now, I reckon. Do you think that, like, when you're 30, you'll have a midlife crisis and just go, like, in Bender's yeah, drone Centre? Yeah, I'll get a Ferrari, get four, four or five Ferraris, I reckon. <laughs> I, when Did, I, I mean, I, it, must, it must be hard to keep that foot on the pedal. 24-7. The thing with my phone, so there's a, we've got a bit of a complex with my phone. It's my way to communicate with my family. They're in Brisbane, obviously interstate. I can FaceTime them and see them. If I didn't have my phone, I couldn't do that. I then miss my family. But the social media, like I think I hate social media. That's, that's the real thing that I don't like. I don't like the fact that people are given the power without any real repercussions to hurt other people. That just doesn't make any sense to me. And a very prime example, I was out with friends the other night for dinner and this younger guy, probably you know, mid-twenties, came up to me, can we have a photo? And it interrupted my conversation. I was very polite, I said, look, sorry, I'm, I don't really want to take a photo right now. Hope you can respect my decision. Have a great night. He goes, no worries, thank you. thanks anyway, and moves on. And then I get a message the next morning. You are fucking pathetic. Who do you think you are? You From know, him. You're weak, all this sort of shit. From him. When the reality was, in real life, oh, no problem, Taylor. Like, thanks anyway. I replied, what a coward as well, actually. Coward, yeah, he called yeah. me a coward, but he's a coward. Anyway, um, so I replied with, you need to understand you have to respect people's decisions to decline a photo. You, I don't owe you a photo. Mm. I then finished with, have a great day, because that's, you know, that's what I'm about. So I never got mad. I just kind of tried to, and maybe, who knows? He never replied. Maybe he'll think next time, you know, fair enough. I'm human as well. I'm not some sort of object. Do you do your own social media or do you have help? Uh, no, yeah, I do it. But I only share things that I want to share. My dogs, most, mostly. My dogs. You've got amazing and, dogs. And sport. And the, they'll be the cleanest dogs in Melbourne. Uh, absolutely. When and you set up this business. Of course, sport. Like, I understand that the ability that I have to influence people in a good way. And if I can, you know, reply back to someone on the message, on, you know, direct message, or if I can help someone, you know, inspire them for the day mm. to go out and do something active and, you know, feel better. Then that's, I'm, I'm happy. That's all I need. Just one last question. You're, like, you're super organized, which, oh, yeah. as I say, being the father of two kids the same age as you, 25 and 23, you're 24, um, you're like a zillion times better organized. They're pretty organized, but you're way more organized. What do you, how do you see yourself in 20 years time? What do you, what would oh, you that's, a, that's a great question. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> and I love just, I love that. I love living like that. I love doing, you know, whatever. I shouldn't say tomorrow because I know exactly what I'm doing tomorrow. My calendar is to the T. But in the next year, I, I don't know where I might be. I don't know what I might be doing, what adventures I might take on. Um, hopefully I can travel internationally because I love to travel and learn things about the world and experience different things. But yeah, I mean, I take all opportunities as they come. And um, you know, I love to do things that may seem a bit obscure or a bit different but I do them because of that because they're going to be exciting and those are the best opportunities that if you take them on I can promise that something will come of it hopefully a good thing but something interesting will come of it oh, thanks Talon thanks so much for coming on the show my pleasure thank, thank you. you bye